So this talk is going to be about IPLD ADLs. And I believe ADL stands, stands for Advanced Data Layout, which sounds pretty complex, but it's actually pretty simple. At the core of IPLD Prime, you've got this node interface, which actually just got moved, so I need to go there. And this interface is sort of like the way you interfi interface with any node from Go. So at the center of it, you've got the kind method, and that tells you what kind am I. So you can have, you can have things that are maps, nodes that are lists. They may be null. They may be simple or scalar type kinds like floats or strings. And that's fine. And when you use, for example, usually nowadays, if you use um, IPLD prime, you might be using its code gen. And when you use its code gen, uh, you end up with, for example, what you end up with is, what would be a good example? I think maybe in node. Ah, come on. Ah, gen demo, that's good. So the code gen, what it does is it generates, for example, um, here's a map from strings or something. So there you go, like with the actual Go map, and then a slice to keep the ordering, because maps in IPLD have to be deterministic. And then it also generates this satisfaction file that has a bunch of methods. And you can see, for example, maybe int, which is an int that may be absent. Uh, you have methods like. Da, 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 kind, and it tells you what kind am I, int. This is code gen, so it's just statically, I'm always an int. You've got other methods like lookup by string, and these methods are defined as I am only valid when my kind is x. So for example, lookup by string is only valid for maps, for map kinds. So in this case, if you call it on something that's not an int, in this case, statically, there's always an int, this is just going to error, and this is just a shortcut for a common error for that case and then somewhere down there as end, then that gives you the actual value. So usually if you're using, um, if you're using IPLD prime nowadays with code gen, that's, how, that's what it looks, looks like. So going back to the type node interface, that's all fine for what you would call data model nodes because they're pretty basic. What you see is what you get. What ADLs do is they allow you to essentially build arbitrary behavior into this stuff. So you could, for example, have a node that implements this interface by having a behavior that doesn't directly map to what data you have on memory or what data you have encoded in DAG.json, for example. And I thought I would show what that means with go IPLD ADL hand. And so a hand, what it is, it's sort of like a hash map that's designed for content addressability, or at least it works decently well for in that world. And essentially, you can think of a map as you know a list of buckets that has a tree and then more buckets and so on. So that's essentially what a hand is um, defined as. But then in IPLD Prime, when you want to use this, you essentially end up with Let's look at types, for example. So I've got I've got hashmap node, for example, which is the internal representation of the hand. So the hand is itself. Uh, I'll show it here. The hand is itself represented as a as 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 the IPLD data model as a bunch of IPLD data model nodes. So you've got the root with some parameters, and then you've got nodes. And nodes then are what contain buckets. But you shouldn't be using this directly if you want to actually use a hand, because then you would have to manually be manipulating the, bu the buckets and rebalancing and everything. You want to use a library that abstracts all of that away. And then when I set foo, the key foo to the value bar, it just automatically deals with all the bucketing and all that stuff. And this is what the ADL layer does for you. So if I go into node, I think. So this is the node, oh, this is the node that actually implements the node interface, but with the layer of I'm gonna deal with all this for you. So kind, kind is always a map. 
So this is similar as before. But when we go into lookup by string, this is where it gets interesting. So lookup by string, it doesn't just use the data model stuff that it has. It hashes the key, and then it looks up into the buckets what to do. Oh, this is actually pretty cool. Um, so yeah, it's essentially going to be, um, it's going to go down into the right node and into the right bucket, and it's just going to fetch the value that you want. Am I in a bucket? Look, look in the bucket. Am I going down one level? Then go down one level. And then there's a bunch of to-dos because I didn't have time to finish this, but you can get an idea of why it's useful to implement this interface for things that are not as static or not as direct, directly mapped to the data model that you might think. Uh, that's pretty much it. Does, does anybody have any questions about what an ADL is or why it's useful? Or any questions about how the HAMT works? What would it take to be able to do mutation or editing? Yeah, so that's possibly the biggest can of worms that I've got left to do, uh, because in, in IPLD prime nodes are immutable, right? So if you want to modify, an, um, if you want to set or modify or delete a value in, exi in an existing map, um, what you could do right now is copy all the values from an old map into a new map, and then just copy all the, copy all the data and generate a new map from scratch. It's going to be really slow. The better way would be to essentially batch a bunch of operations like adding, deleting, setting, and so on, and then efficiently apply those and only copy the data model nodes that you need to update. So for example, if you only need to update one bucket, that node would update. And then the CIDs all the way to the root would update, but everything else would be the same CIDs and nodes, same blocks. I have not done that, though. So quick question. If I want to build my own ADL, yep. what I have to do is implement the interface. Right now, yes. Um, with Eric, we've talked about, well, actually, if you're implementing an ADL, you usually want to say, I want to implement a map ADL. And then you only need to implement a few methods. All the others you don't care about. You only need to implement kind is going to be static as map. You want to implement lookup by string. Um, I'm going to go back to the interface to show. Uh. Because you're implementing the node interface. Yes. And why we call the so so what's special about the ADL? So why is it different from like I'm implementing my own node yeah. to an actual ADL? Well, it's essentially that an ADL is an implementation of the node interface that has arbitrary behavior. But it, it, the, uh, what's behind that could be anything. It's just that the hand. Right. So the ADL is a concept, no? It's yeah. Not an implementation. Yeah, but I think I think in general ADLs are backed by IPLD data model data, if that makes sense. Because for example, a hand is the actual data you've got in the data model is a bunch of buckets and trees and stuff. But then you've got the ADL layer that shows it to you as a map, and that has the extra logic. So I think I think in IPLD the ADLs are meant to be backed by data model nodes, because if you back them by like memory, then it's not really useful for IPLD because it's just memory. You can't really share it with others. And if I wanted to like start building my own ADL, yep. What would be the process? So the the manual process would be sort of what I showed you with the hand, which is. Um, the, the node interface and... Implement the node interface with your own type. Mm -hmm. And then underneath that, you would probably use, for example, code gen data model Schema. nodes to, yeah, to actually define the, I don't know what to call it. Like the, I think Eric calls it the substrate, like the actual data underneath like your ADL. The, your kinds, which in the end are schema type. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then those things are what, what you could, for example, put in blocks and mm -hmm. share with other people. So like, Here's my, when, when you go to other people and, and say, here's my hand, you don't give them the whole map as a map. You give them the tree with the buckets, right? And in the selector, we'll do the block. Yeah. yeah. Does your implementation of hand have a, a sorry. Uh, <laughs> does, your implement, does, your import, does your implementation have a, a, like a link system or a loader to load up the nodes in it? Yes. Uh, I, I added this towards the end of yeah, this yeah. project. I think I called it with linking. Yeah. No, hey, wait. Am I? I'm on the wrong. Wait, did you? But it, otherwise, how do you implement like lookup by string? Yeah. 
exactly. No, I don't want GitHub. Hang on a sec. Uh, where's delete? Gotta love how uh, code, yeah. So I, I added this essentially. Uh, and then you can say, um, essentially when you start, but you could set this later probably. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and then it just remembers this. So when it, for example, when it tries to cross a boundary and it doesn't have a block, it will then use the linux system. Oh, I was wondering about that. Yeah, that, that's a common thing. I've noticed that often have some ADLs that are designed to like take like a, a multi-block node structure and present it with like a, a single, single node interface. Yeah. Gotcha. Now, uh, so this is great. My only concern was like, what is the way of, I mean, it's a fast way of, or some DSL to implement yeah. ADLs, or we have to go through the interface implementation. It's okay. like. Not that hard, but there are a lot of methods that you can use. So I think we should I think we should expose two easy wrappers that call something like new map ADL, and then you give it a function that's like uh, get get by string, and another that maybe implements an iterator, and then it essentially imp, you know plugs that into the core of a map ADL because that would be great to, to minimize the number of functions that you need to implement. Yeah, because many are like just standard stuff like the kind of mentioned. Yeah, it's also true that um, there's a bit, it's not just about getting by string um, because that's as far as I got. I But you also have lookup by node because your map could be keyed by anything. Um, you also have iteration and iteration might be a little bit harder to plug in. Um, well, I guess you would pro provide the implementation of this maybe. Uh, there's also like, I mean, if you do a generated, like, I don't know, like if you do a generated type with the code gem, like you also, like it often generates like other convenience methods that are, are not part of the node interface, but like are useful because they give you less generic types if you want to use them. Like, yeah. Yeah, there's like a, I can't remember, there's like an iterator, like it generates just an iterator that will give you like a type. Of yeah. It's also worth pointing out that, um, Something that Hannah mentioned the other day um, about code gen here is that if you look at my implementation of the hand, when I actually use the code gen hash map root, I, I cheat all the time because I'm way too lazy. So for example, the bucket size, I just fetch it with the unexported field. <laughs> so <laughs> so yeah. I, I think this would be a little bit nicer if I used bind node because then it would just be like simple go types. Um, is, is it even for like, like collected all of our use of this and like presented it to Eric and be like, this is evidence we need an easier interface. We need yeah. something easier. But the thing is, so it makes sense. How I'm approaching like this is that if you're building the functions or the wrappers around the schema, yeah. you're allowed to do that. But then you present it to the outside without that. Uh, yeah. um, because but, they are private numbers. Yes. So, so that's why, like, I usually don't expose them in the root of the package, right? In, and it's internal, something like that. So I can use them, but the rest of the world can't. Yeah, yeah. I'm selfish. So, do you want to talk about the Unix FS ADL? Uh, yeah, we can just take sure, this over. Sure. Um, I don't know what it is though. Okay, no, no, no. It's cool. It, it, as long as I have a web browser, I can make this yeah, work. Yeah, I'm just showing what's happening. So, what are they doing during this tab? Doing this tab. Okay, cool. And now we see it, and I can remember how to use a PC. Uh, okay, yeah, so this is an interesting uh, implementation of an ADL. Um, uh, so basically, Unix, the Unix of SV1 is really weird in the sense that it is a Unix FSV1 is encoded with protobuf nodes using the like DAG proto uh, specification, which is like DAG proto is like a very early uh, IPLD codec that does not support the whole data model. It's got, you know, like it's definitely like 
we were, this is a long, long time ago that it came into being. Um, and uh, one of the things that's interesting about the structure of DAG, uh, of, uh, how a DAG protobuf works is that it's basically got two, it always has two fields. There's a data and a links field. And the links is a list, uh, like, a, you know, like a, an ordered list. Um, uh, and then, but then each element in the link, in the links uh, field uh, has a name for the link. So it's like, it's like the structure is list, but each element has like a, of the list has a name. And that name is actually probably more useful than the index in the list. Um, and it's so, an map. what? It's an ordered map. Yeah, it's essentially an ordered map and you probably want to look up things by the, by the, by the map key. And in fact, the Go, Go IPFS does this everywhere. They look up things by map key. So we had this, so the, the way this actually got started is we had this interesting problem. We were trying to integrate uh, Go IPLD prime into uh, Go IPFS, um, where we had done all this work with to, to decode uh, protobufs in a Go IPLD prime. Um, uh, Dan wrote uh, Go codec dadpd, which does, uh, which does reading of, sorry, did I, do you go by nickname Daniel, Dan or just Daniel? I'll do Daniel. Sorry about that. Um, uh, Daniel wrote uh, Go Kodak Dag PD, which like deserializes um, uh, deserializes Dag Proto into IPLD prime nodes, but it, I, it it deserializes them in like the way you would expect a Go IPL the Go IPLD prime data model to work, which is like the the links field is a list, right? Um, and so we were trying to figure out. Well, we wanted to be able to run selectors on protobuf nodes, and the selectors were almost always going to be path selectors that expected named keys. So the original way this got started is we were trying to write a version of Go of a Merkle DAG node uh, or DAG proto node that you could call lookup by string on and iterate like a map. Um, and so that's actually this one, the very fir first root version was a path PB node. Um, and this, ah, and like literally all this thing is, is like, it's basically a, it has underneath, like here's path PB node and underneath it, it has a so-called, I called it substrate because that was the word that, that Eric was using everywhere for like, this is the underlying node. That, that we're using. And if you look at this, like the main methods are like look up by string and then look up by node. And then like everything else just defers to the substrate, which itself just errors, you know, like so, so that makes it easy. Um, and, you know, like, and then we have like, a, we did write an iterator or a Unix FS um, iterator. And then uh, like, I'm trying to think what other methods. So you, you can see that here again, we're just deferring to the substrate element. Um, and then we like added these, like, these are like those weird, like generated code gen methods, like iterator, which is not a map iterator or a list iterator, but a nice, like super typed iterator that allows you to do stuff. Um, so yeah, this is what we built. And then it kind of like, so then it like went from there and we were like, okay, well we did that. Um, and then we were like, I think that was the very first implementation. We were just trying to get Go path to work um, with selectors. Um, and it was working until we got to the point of getting a Unix FS sharded HAMP directory, which is a thing that you need to be able to support. Um, Unix FS has two, two, directory, two um, directory models. One is a, a, a regular map directory where like in the, the Merkle DAG is represented, or the DAG proto is like, the data and then the links is just the list of like files and or directories in the directory. So essentially the LS of the, the directory. The other version is that the way the directory list is maintained is actually a HAMP that is embedded in the links field of the DAG proto. Um, and that's a Unix of a sharded directory. And so at that point we're like, okay, well now we need to support this. And then that required finding out, like the, the very first version was like, oh, we'll just support lookup by string. And then we were like, wait a second, if we need to support this other version, we need to actually look at each Unix FS like file and or directory to determine exactly what type it is. 
the way Unix FS basically works is that the data member of the DAG protobuf structure encodes in itself a nested protobuf structure, <laughs> which uh, describes what the Unix FS thing is. So that's how we ended up writing this like, okay, well, I guess we better write some Unix FS stuff. Um, where is that stuff? I don't even remember. Iteration, utilities, hamp, directory, right? I think data is where we first like, this is just like the thing to like, what does this thing do? I can't remember what this does. Uh, oh my God. Oh, it looks generated. Let's look at the, the code gen. The code gen is the easiest way to figure out what this schema is. I'm pretty sure this schema was like, yeah, let's see. This is written real, this is a fast, right? Uh, right. So this is like, this is, we, we have building an IPLD node to like, deserialize the Unix FS protobuf into an IPLD node so we can look at methods on it. And so then we have like Unix FS data, which has like these fields. And then I don't remember how we, how the heck did we actually deserialize it? I don't, there must, there must be some code to unmarshal and marshal it. Anyway, uh, sorry, right. And then how does it unmarshal? I'm fascinated. <laughs> could sue decode Unix FS data. Oh, okay. Oh, right. There's like basically some like protobuf consuming code to like read it. I just, I actually took this from your protobuf like oh, method no. and I just was like, okay, well, this is how Dan's doing and I'll just do this, but with all the fields that I'm aware of. So yeah, it's actually re consuming the protobuf and then building an IPLD node out of it. You can't blame me for that. What? <laughs> you can't blame me for that. Oh, that was... Yeah. Um, so yeah, so that's reading that. And then like, we're like, so then we have um, Unix FS node, and then we have a hamped, the sharded hamped implementation. This is pure, this is the, this is one fun fact is that in the world of protocol lab stack, we have two different concepts of a hamped. One is like a general purpose hamped, which is like the thing that um, Daniel had implemented. And then the other is this thing in Unix FS1, like the sharded directory, which is like a totally different implementation of, I mean, it's still a hamped, but like it's a different implementation, different code, all that stuff. And it is specifically for directories. Um, so yeah, we have this implementation here. And I believe the big main function here is like getting lookup by string to work, which is like, pretty funky in here if I remember correctly. Let's see, we have lookup by segment. Where's lookup by string? Lookup by node. We have lookup attempt. Oh my God, right. There was a lot of stuff going on. We have this internal lookup functioning and you can see it's like actually quite a complicated function. And then, um, and then it's like trying to like load the next node. Cause you know, like a, a unit FS, like a hamp is like a multi node structure. Um, and eventually, like, I believe it produces like something at the end. Um, and this is largely taken from the existing Unix FS code and like moved over, but it's not that bad. Um, uh, it's, sorry. <laughs> it's no problem. <laughs> One thing that is obviously important here is that this has to have a link system in it, right? Um, so that's a, that's a tricky um, little element. And then one thing that got implemented Got, in, got sort of like thrown in the mix here um, as a result of doing this. So we ended up doing this for like all of the, the cool thing is that it works for basically for all, um, all, for all of the read functions for the most part in, oh, sorry, no, we did, we did a Unix FS read for directories and charted directories. We haven't done one for an ADL for files themselves. It's not clear exactly what that ADL should look like. Obviously one version would be to just have the bytes field return all of the bytes in the file, but that may not be that useful. We may want it to actually be able to do like byte ranges and stuff. Um, one thing that was interesting out of this is we ended up making one other thing that goes into, um, goes into what's it called? Uh, IPLD's link system itself, which is that the, you can set on the link system a so-called node reifier. And what this will do is at the um, at the um, at the very end of the node loading process, at the point where it gets to like the regular IPLD node, 
um, you can specify a reifier function. Reifying, I'm not exactly sure why that's the word we're using, um, but uh, it is how you, reifying means going from the original to the ADL. Um, uh, and in this case, like what we're doing, this is a node reif reifying function. And we're like, okay, if we have a, and this runs on like every node that gets loaded by uh, the IPLD li link system. Like what we do is we're like, okay, did we get, do we have a DAG protobuf node? Um, if not, just return it as is. Do we have a data node in which case, I believe what it will do is it will, if there's no, sorry, if there's no field data, then it will assume that it is like not a Unix FS node. Um, and so therefore it will treat it. I believe the default reifier here is just to return this like path PUP node. So we're saying all of our Merkle DAG nodes, we'd prefer to treat as path PUP nodes, um, meaning like we can look up the, the links by string just because that's useful. Um, and then, uh, right, and then what is, what is this thing? I can't remember. So like, then we like look at, okay, it has a data, so we try to decode it as Unix FS. If that doesn't work, we just go back to returning a path PB node. And then like, if we have a Unix FS node, based on the type of Unix FS node, we get like a builder and the builder, anyway, it doesn't really matter, but it does the, the magic with the, the, the directories. Um, so essentially when you load, uh, if you use this, whenever you're using like your selector traversal, when you load a Unix FS node it, or a Merkle DAG node, it will either convert it to a path node, in which case like you can use lookup by string on it, or if it's a Unix FS node, it'll con convert it to either a regular directory or a, um, or a sharded directory. So that was the thing we ended up doing. Um, it was just, it was actually, I think the main so, thing that so was- So the point of that reifier is to mimic current IPFS Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so that, like, the reason it's doing things like treating them as path PP nodes is so that you have the same path PP method. Yeah. Like that, and so that maybe doesn't even belong in this specific uh, ADL. It it kind of doesn't. Yeah. <laughs> it kind of got. Yeah. We first were. Yeah. So, but like, um, it, it is still useful for compatibility and like also like you know it was kind of cool that like we did this and like all of a sudden. In like a week, we ended up implementing like a lot of the read side of Unix FS in D1 in uh, IPLD5, which is unique. And we even implemented it with that, one, what is the Unix FS 1.5 edition? I think there's like some additional bytes that you get in Unix FS V1.5 that doesn't exist in regular Unix FS V1. And we added it to this. So if we were to finish it, we would get the Unix FS. V1.5 at some point. Well, we, we just switched over to this and then we could get this to V1.5. Yes. Yes. The spec is finished. Yeah, the spec is finished, yeah. It's not implemented in Go IPFS though, right? It's implemented in JavaScript. Oh, okay, it's in JavaScript. Yeah, so if we were to finish this, one of the things that's interesting, I think like an open development question in IPLD Prime is like, we didn't attempt to implement any of the like writing or modification side of this because like, it's not like the builder interfaces are tricky for how you're going to do all that. And like, and then like the other ideas that, well, there'd be this like selector traversal with modification and there's like an implementation of that sort of, but like really not built out. Um, so it's an interesting question. Yeah. So I'm going to jump back to ADLs. Yeah. Um, the, what are the next things for ADLs? What? For this thing or no, no, for ADLs. Well, so I, th I think we could talk about two topics. One of them might be make it easier to write simple ADLs. Oh, I think I went to the wrong tab. I'm sorry. No, that's fine. It's, uh, it's showing the second tab. Okay, this one. I might have made my cursor too sensitive. <laughs> okay. Um, so I think on one side, it's make it easier to write simple ADLs, which is what Alfonso was mentioning. And I think, I'm not sure if we need generics for that. I haven't thought about it enough, but I think we could do some things about like make it easier for maps and lists. And I think on the other side, there's, we need to figure out some interfaces for update and bulk operations. 
because for example, if you want to do some bulk modify operations in a hand or a UNIXFS or an AMT or whatever else, I think the interface should be somewhat intuitive and common uh, because it, otherwise we're just reinventing the wheel in every single ADL. And once we have those two things, I think they would AMT, be- AMT, ADL, when? <laughs> Are you saying I can spend two weeks on it? Uh, I, I guess the other thing that I wanted to bring up is like ADL integration into the rest of the world. So right now yeah. we've got this on a link system, we can put one ADL as the reifier, or we can find one reify function to try and say, great, I've got nodes in this link system context. This is like, you know, I can have some heuristic set of things to try and apply ADLs in some cases. Um, it is plausible, like th there continues to be thought about like where where and when you want to invoke equals. And so one of the places that it's been talked about that I think generally people haven't been too unhappy about is long term it might make sense to put ADLs on selectors. So in a selector, um, you might be able to convey at some point in this lecture, I, I'm now at this node and I would like to interpret this node with this ADL. So for instance, I'm traversing through some large DAG, but in this place, I need to now interpret it as a hand because I want you know, this logical map key out of it, but I'm, I'm not wanting to convey the forward path, the forward jumps through the actual uh, implementation of that, or I might not even know them in some cases. Um, I think that may even be more true with like some sorts of um, like shared directories if it's like you know SFS data, things like that. That you you've got your logical path, but you don't actually want to have that underlying path through it. You want to have the sort of the logical path that you you're showing in all cases. And I guess you would specify the ADL in the selector because you might want to choose a different ADL for different situations over the same data, right? Because if you hard code it in the CSD. Awesome. If you hard code it in the CID, I guess you would be kind of stuck with what's defined there. Well, if you've got the CID, you could potentially get that as well and, and just go directly to the CID if you care. And so it's more for like browsing or universal type things, I guess. Can you give us some context here? This is discussed a lot in terms of types and how we type CIDs. Uh, content we talk about is the like one option is you have a format or like a prefix CID that points to schema or some type of information. Uh, alternative is like a quick pack of CIDs. But once the ID points the type of information on the schedule of the selector, the ADL or whatever, and the second half of the CID points the actual data. Uh, but this gets complicated when we never solved it. So we kind of punted this out and said, okay, my ADLs are this thing. And they're just defined independently. It's not part of the data itself. It's separate things you sort of overlay. Okay. And if you have two CIDs, one that points to the data, another one that points to the ADL, what do you mean by points to the ADL? Does that mean like, uh, some sort of multi codec that moment, defines it, or uh, either a multi codec that either you, got, you wouldn't have a CID for some multi codec that defines that, or uh, you could have some like some description of the ADL and how it works, potentially a WASM program or some other mm -hmm. information as far as how to actually access the data. Uh, but again, this stuff started getting into magical lava land, and we just said, you know what, we have to do things. So, yeah, you know, and then the uh, it seems like the other big unknown frontier is ADLs. Networks. Um, in the sense that, like, if you wish to do, you know, it, it basically this is primarily about that. But well, that should be similar, right? It's the part, same thing as like, if you don't know some part of the selector, this is, in this case, basically you don't know that part of the selector. Right. Oh, uh, OK, yeah. Like, I would like to be able to actually negotiate this for, like, if I give you a selector, you can execute until you don't know something. Then I would like you to be able to just tell me, hey, I don't know this, and I can sort of continue on and just do this walk until you know something. That Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, yeah, yeah. You would communicate the ADL in in so, the request in some fashion. There's, that may not be possible. Like, yeah, it'd be possible if I can get you to know, fix the arbitrary code. Uh, but I can't always do that. Yeah, of course. We'll okay. see if we can do it in Yes, that okay. would make our lives better. So that that's one half is you know by by transmitting an ADL indication, what you transmit is the SID of a WASM thing that complies with an ADL yeah. interface. Yeah. Um, right. So we'll see how long. When, once we have a VM oh, that, that executes WASM in an IPLV context, it'll be. I'm just assuming you guys figure out that stuff. I'm going to do the execution. Oh, I thought you had the WASM. No, I'm, I'm just kidding. 
Um, <laughs> <laughs> we should be looking to figure out some way to do selectors and watch. We're gonna have to do it. We are gonna selectors and watch them would be like to add random custom selectors. Yellow pool pool well, in this case, we're gonna throw them. Anyway, so anyway, 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 anyway,